Welcome to the demo scene for Magic Time, local time scales. We're going to follow along with the quick start guide. Go to infinitypbr.com, click on the scripting docs or the link in the asset store description. Scroll down to the Magic Time local time scale. Click on quick start and this video will be up here. And we're going to walk through this through the demo scene so we can walk over the basic setup. It doesn't take too much time to implement this in your project. The first thing you'll want to do is to create your class. Your class either needs to implement I have local time or inherit from magic time user. So we've got demo class here, just load it up. In our class here, we're going to inherit from magic time user. And this is going to give us a whole lot of exposed properties and fields in the inspector. If you look into the magic time user, it is an I have local time. And there's all these wonderful methods and properties here ready to go. So if we create an empty object here and throw on the demo class onto that, we can see those exposed parameters here. For the purposes of this demo, though, we're going to delete those. Instead, we're going to check out the sphere class, which is in the demo scene. The sphere is a magic time user, and it has some additional code here for the demo scene. So let's check out the sphere class here in the inspector. We have some properties here that come from the magic time user class. We have the initial time scales. We'll get to those in a minute. The transition dur duration and transition curve. Currently this is set to zero. If you want the any time changes to transition automatically, you can set this to not zero and then have a curve so you can have a more curved transition rather than a straight transition. And we also have the default time scale for the time scale that's attached to this object. The magic time user will have its own local time scale. So we'll have the initial time scales that we want to follow, but we also have our own time scale that is specific to this object so that this object can have its time changed with no other object being affected. The time scales we set in the initial time scales can be shared between other objects. If we look back at the inspector here, we see that the red sphere will subscribe to the demo global and demo red local time scales. Similarly, the blue will be subscribed to the blue and the global and the green will be subscribed to the green and the global. So now in the demo scene, we can see that we have the global time scale slider. And as we move this up or down, it affects all of the spheres that are going around the scene. If we just move the red up, it affects only the red. And if we move the green, we can affect only the green. And of course, the blue will affect only the blue. Each one of these objects also has its own local time scale, though the demo scene does not have any sliders for individual objects to be modified. So let's dig into these time scales. To create a new time scale, go ahead and right click, create local time scale, time scale, and we'll call this new scale. This is a scriptable object and at runtime, a new instance of this object will be created. So these unity events here shouldn't really be populated in the inspector. Instead, if you want to use these events, set those up via your code. Once these instances have been created at runtime by default, the value of a local time scale is going to be set to one and the auto remove when empty value will be true. In the demo scene, we have our demo blue, green, red, and global. The values are going to be the same for all of them. Generally speaking, I don't expect most users will need to change the value from one. This is the starting value. One means normal time, uh, similar to the exact value of time dot delta time. So let's look at this magic time manager in your scene, create an object, call it magic time manager if you'd like, and add the magic time manager class to it. You can then populate the initial time scales with any time scale scriptable object that you want to be available in the game for any other object to subscribe to and be affected by. And so here we've added our global and the three colors, red, green, and blue. When we press play with the magic time manager selected, we actually see some information about the time scales here. The inspector doesn't update unless you move your mouse over it. So just keep moving your mouse if you want to see the values change in real time here. But you can see the value of each of these time scales. You can also see how many subscribers are currently subscribed to them. That helps with debugging a little bit. So as we can see, all 12 of the spheres are subscribed to global and then four each, each sphere is subscribed to each of the colors. The all time scales list will list all the time scales in the project 
that are not being automatically brought in through the initial time scales. So if we add another new time scale here and then go back to our magic time manager, we see it was added as well. So now there's six time scales. If we delete these, when we go back to the magic time manager, those will have been deleted and there's only the four left. This way you have access to all of the time scales in your project via the magic time manager, even those that have not been brought into the project via the initial time scales. If you ever need to reference those scriptable objects, you can do so via the all time scales list here. So now going back to our sphere, this is where you'll want to set up your initial time scales. And these are going to be time scales that you want your object to be affected by. Generally speaking, I expect most people will need a global time scale. That's going to control the time for the entire project, uh, similar to time.delta time, which you probably won't be changing anymore once you use the system. A global time scale can be subscribed by every object that has local time so that once you change that global time scale value, all objects are affected. And of course, for the red ones, we're also gonna subscribe to the demo red time scale since this is a red object. So let's see how this works in our code. Our sphere has a sphere movement class as well, and we have a base speed of five. This movement class moves these spheres to various waypoints in a bounding box. Line 32 controls the movement here, and instead of using time.delta time, we're using the sphere.delta time. This is the sphere class, and it has a delta time fixed delta time and unscaled delta time, just like the time class built into Unity. We're multiplying that by our base speed to get the final speed of our sphere. And that's all you really have to do. We've set up our time scales, brought those time scales in via the magic time manager into our scene and added them to the initial time scales. We've made our sphere class, which inherits from magic time user, and then populated the initial time scales we'd like to subscribe to and we've set up the code making these spheres move using the delta time from the magic time user class rather than time.delta time. Now of course each object can be affected by additional time scales. You can code that yourself, make them subscribe to other time scales, maybe via magic spells or or difficulty settings. So let's show how these time zones work in order to affect objects that enter them and speed up or slow down those objects when they are entered. The demo scene has two spheres here, a slow zone and a fast zone. Each of these has a time zone script on it. This is a script that comes with magic time and the inspector has some options for us. The first one is a toggle to create a new local time scale. If checked, you, this will create one at runtime. Otherwise, you'll need to populate a time scale object that you've created in your project into this field. For these, we're just gonna create a brand new one at runtime. And our time scale value will be set to 0.33. Now, of course, if you do populate this from an existing time scale, the time scale value set in that will be used here. And on these, that time scale value is one. But we're going to create a new local time scale and we're gonna set that time scale for the slow to 0.33. For the fast zone, it's set to three. You have the option to show the default inspector if you'd like. You do not need to do that. It will be checked off. And then when we press play, we will see in the inspector, the in-game subscribers will be updated as they are entering and exiting these zones. And of course, if we pause, we can click this button to ping the object in our hierarchy. And we can zoom in on it and see where it is in the scene view. So let's dig into the code here to see how this is actually working so you can better understand how you might set up additional logic for your project and the mechanics in your game. The time zone class has an on trigger enter and on trigger exit as well as the 2D versions of these methods. And we're gonna first ignore the collider that triggers this if the collider itself is a trigger. And then we're gonna check to make sure that the other object has a I have local time either in itself or in its parent. Oftentimes the collider itself will not be on the same exact object that has the I have local time class. Instead, the I have local time class might be on a parent of the collider. So we're gonna check for the component in the parent. And if that's null, then we return. We're not gonna handle anything that's not an I have local time. And once we find that, we're gonna call either on enter or on exit, passing that local time user 
into these methods. And these methods are going to have the local time user subscribe to a local time scale, this time scale, and or unsubscribe from that same time scale. The time zone itself has its own time scale. And of course you can change the time scale value at runtime as well. And that will affect anything that's subscribed to the time scale on this time zone. So what does the subscribe to local time scale do? This is the magic time user class. If you're implementing, I have local time and not using the magic time user, then you might want to reference magic time user to get some ideas of how you might set up these required methods. One of them is subscribe to local time scale and one is the unsubscribe. In the subscribe method here, we're gonna first make sure that my time scale is not null. First, we're gonna to check to see that we're not already subscribed to this time scale. If we are, we're just gonna return a magic time user can only be subscribed to a time scale once. Then we're gonna add the new time scale to our subscribe time scales dictionary. We're going to then tell the time scale that something did subscribe to it and pass in this as the thing that subscribed to it. And on time scale change is triggered every time the value of a specific time scale changes. Whenever we receive an event from on time scale changed, Every subscriber will then recalculate what its final time scale should be because one of the time scale values has changed. And that won't be triggered right away. And so after subscribing, we do need to reset the desired time scale. So that's it for the quick start guide. You can play with the demo if you'd like to see how it works and definitely dig into the documentation here. There's a whole lot of information about each of the different main components, as well as some scripting documentation, frequently asked questions and tips and tricks as well. Come to the Discord if you have any questions, and I hope to see you real, real soon. Bye.